Hi everyone, my name is Ben Emeline Jones and I'm at the UFO Academy Watford. I'm here at this beautiful, luxurious, stately home in the middle of the countryside and I'm here to talk about the Nottinghamshire Roswell. And welcome to the second part in this series of lectures here at the UFO Academy. Just want to say <clears throat> thanks to all of you for coming. Really appreciate you being here. Thanks to Katrina and Jonathan for inviting me to this event. And um, it really is a lovely event, a lovely location. I mean, uh, there's a chandelier and everything. It's like, it's not a usual UFO conference. I mean, uh, it's one of the, I've, I've been to this event before, and um, very, very often I wonder at the uh, opulence of our surroundings. It's kind of like being uh, trapped in a, uh, a joint remake of Close Encounters and Bright Head Revisited. That's what it feels like. Right, well, um, I'm here, as you see, I'm, I'm wearing this red shirt. And um, there's a story behind this red shirt, and it all goes back to the the difference between the terms ufology and exopolitics. Are you both are you familiar with both of those terms? Have you heard both of those terms, everybody? Yeah. Good. Yeah. They, now, some of you have not. Oh, well. Basically, ufology is what you might call the scientific investigation of UFOs, of the UFO phenomenon, and it's it's the most common way people deal with UFOs. They look at them, they examine reports and investigations, and they say, are they real, are they not? What's, which, what's real, what's not? Do they exist, or are they just swamp gas, etc., etc.? That's ufology. Exopolitics is different. Exopolitics is um, basically saying, yes, they exist. Now, what are we going to do about it? So exopoliticians are kind of, um, I suppose we're ufologists who've made up our minds. I can hold it a little bit further away, that's all right. Okay, I'll turn you down a tiny bit. <clears throat> okay. Now, uh, Nick Pope, bless him, um, he, he was uh, interviewed uh, by The Sun, and he described um, exopolitics as the militant wing of ufology. That's why I've got this red shirt on. All I can say is, long live the revolution, comrades! <laughs> Now, uh, Nick Pope got married. Uh, did you hear about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He married his, his fiance Elizabeth in Arizona at the UFO Congress. It was a bit awkward at first, though, because uh, the first ceremony didn't go according to plan. He's standing in front of the vicar. The vicar says, Nicholas, do you take this woman Elizabeth to be your lawful wedded wife to love and hold, to cherish, protect from this day forward till death do you part? <coughs> Nick replied, I can neither confirm nor deny that. <laughs> Anyway, he's not here today, so I can take the mickey out of him with impunity. <coughs> now, um, this, uh, this is the opening image of Nottinghamshire Roswell. I'm going to talk to you today about the Nottinghamshire Roswell, and you might think that it's uh, strange that these two, at least you see these two things together. Roswell is, of course, a city in New Mexico, United States of America, and Nottinghamshire, of course, is a county in, in England. So, Roswell is not in Nottinghamshire, but the reason um, this, I'm calling this the Nottinghamshire Roswell is, it's, it's, it's a term I invented, is because um, Roswell, of course, is the location of a specific event, which I'm sure most of you have heard, heard of, which is where basically a UFO crashed and was retrieved by the United States government in July of 1947. Yet, uh, for people who investigate UFOs, the, the term Roswell has come to mean more than that. It refers not so much to a place as to a category of ufology, to an actual particular kind of event which, is not, which has happened, which did happen at Roswell, but has been repeated again and again across the world. So what happened at Roswell to the uh, flying saucer that crashed there, whatever craft it was that crashed there, has happened in many, many other places too. And I've got a, this book here is interesting. This is Colin's book. He's just lent it me to, to use for this presentation. It's called Magic Eyes Only, Earth's Encounters with Extraterrestrial Technology by Ryan S. Wood. 
And um, there's a list in here, in the, in the contents page. Um, it covers an entire century, and there's about 100 entries in, in, this, in this book, which is it's researched. Which um, refer to subjects very, very similar to Roswell in many, many different ways. And um, these refer to a, an incident where an artifact from an extraterrestrial source comes to, grief on the Earth, comes to grief on the Earth's surface and it is secretly salvaged by the government and then kept secret. The government maintained that nothing happened and it's, they sometimes come up with a, a cover story, like the weather balloon story or something like that. Um, this happens everywhere in the world. It happens in this country and many others. This is not the only British event I'm going to talk about. And it's, I think it's only a matter of time before the Oxford English Dictionary um, includes the word Roswell, an entry for the word Roswell as a common noun to refer to this kind of event. And the fact that the same thing happens all over the world, wherever you, wherever you go, where one of these events, where one of these UFOs crashes, leads to the inevitable conclusion there is some kind of global policy in place when it comes to dealing with these events. Um, why? And who, who introduced this policy? How? I don't know. That's a big subject, but, and it's certainly worth investigating. <clears throat> but that's, um, but the Nottinghamshire Roswell is one of these events. Now then. And that there is an image, it's a, an artist's image of the Roswell incident of 1947, a possible, possibly what happened. Not, it's not necessarily definitely what happened. Now, uh, this is, um, yeah, this is uh, Nexus. It's the Nexus magazine. How many of you read this? It's an excellent magazine. I do recommend it. Well done, yeah, I do recommend this. This is uh, Nexus Volume 4, Issue 6, covered October, November 1997. And in this um, particular episode, um, edition of Nexus, they cover what they call the Mansfield incident, which is basically the same event I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon, although I called it the Nottinghamshire Roswell. Um, and this Nexus drew its source on a, um, a UFO magazine. Now, of course, there was 10 years before between this article being published and the event in question. The event in question happened in November of 1987. Now, the, the long period of time between <coughs> UFO events and investigation commencing is a curse of ufology. And 10 years is not long compared to some. It's 31 years in the case of the Roswell incident, over 70 years in the case of the Aurora incident. But basically, it refers to an event that happened on Thursday, the 12th of November, 1987. It happened at 1.30 in the morning. It was a Thursday, it was a weekday. Most people were in bed asleep. There was a huge aerial explosion. Um, it's been described in the media as a freak storm or a freak thunderbolt. And it damaged a number of properties. It damaged a large, it covered a large area, you know, a dozen square miles in, in diameter, this area that was affected. And the shockwave actually damaged people's properties. There were structural damage to houses and this very, very loud noise. Curiously though, um, it was quiet, the weather was beautiful that evening. There was no cloud, uh, there was no wind, no rain, certainly no thunderstorms. Cloudless night. Now, um, what was odd was at the same time there were objects seen in the sky. The witnesses saw objects seen in the sky and um, they describe objects which do not travel in a straight line. Both of the witnesses that actually spoke out and were featured and were actually quoted in this magazine said um, one of them describes it as flying um, in a zigzag pattern, another describes it as loop the looping, double looping. And someone described how the sky became bright red, which is very <coughs> unusual. So it was, this was not an aircraft. And um, basically, this object descended, people reported descending and crashing in an area called the Misk Hills, which I'll describe in more detail later on because I've actually been there. <clears throat> um, along with these, um, these objects in the sky and this huge explosion were curious electromagnetic effects and um, there were cases in which um, lights switched on in people's houses by themselves or switched off, fuses burst, 
There were um, TV aerials splitting two, power lines collapsing. And uh, one of the principal witnesses to this event was actually an insurance broker in the area. And he um, was inundated with claims and um, for damage to property, but also for damage to electronic equipment. The local TV and video repair shop was, the phone was ringing off the hook there. And apparently there were 40 insurance claims made for one street for damage to TV and audio and video equipment, damaged by this thunderbolt. <coughs> it's actually a miracle no one was killed. It's actually pretty, um, pretty violent event actually what happened. And the location of the event was here. <coughs> this is um, this is roughly according to what I've calculated the area that was affected. This is actually Ashfield district in West Nottinghamshire. And um, as you see, it's a very, very large, this is actually about 10 miles across. Very, very large area. Factory. Now what happened was the explosion was heard all over this area. It was centred just south of Mansfield, Nottinghamshire, here. So um, what happened was there was some, a report of an object. Sometimes some people say there were more than one object. It was this actually. I've seen someone with this. That's good, isn't it? Not used one of these before. An object apparently came in from a northeast to southwesterly direction. So people describe it as heading from, it was seen between Mansfield, which is here, and Lydeth, which is down there, and Sherwood Forest, which is there, heading the southwesterly direction towards Kirkby and Ashfield, which is there. And as I've already described to you, it was descending slowly. People reported it made a whining sound, and some people interpreted that as it being in trouble, although that's pretty much speculation, although its subsequent behaviour does, in a, in a sense, itself, corroborate that, because what happened to it? Yeah, they, um, now what happened was it came, it's reported as coming down in a forested area near Blyth, where it actually bounced. This is how it's described. It came down in the middle of the forest, but it didn't stay there for long. It appeared to have just landed briefly, this object, and then came up into the air again. People report that some people say there were more than one object, and there was some kind of collision just south of Mansfield. It's, um, it's, it's hard to say, but there was, there was a report there was certainly think more than one object. Some people claim it was shot down by a missile, I don't know about that. But uh, we, that's more than we know right now. But it bounced in a, in a forested area and took off again. And then it came to rest, it, came to, it eventually landed. I'll be showing you where these, these events actually happened in a short while. But at 2.15 a.m., Somebody reported seeing a number of military helicopters in the area, including a Chinook, which is a um, large helicopter. It's a transport, it transport troops and equipment and things like that. It's easily recognisable because it has two rotor blades. One of those was seen there. Um, so they responded very quickly. And um, that, that leads me to suspect that's interesting because it appears they had some kind of advanced notice that something was going to happen in that area. Again, we don't know how the government knew about this, but the government did seem to have advance notice. But these helicopters were scanning the ground with, with searchlights, <coughs> rather like police helicopters do. And um, they eventually located um, an object on the ground. Now, uh, some people say that it's uh, 60 feet across. There's several witnesses report various sizes. Some people say 30 or 40, some people say 60 feet across. We don't know what shape it was, whether it was a saucer, cigar-shaped object, or anything else. <coughs> The article in Nexus was written by Harry Mason, who's an Australian. Oh, he's an Australian, and he, he puts this down to some kind of weapons test. I'm not sure about that. I think that's, uh, he's um, jumping the gun a little bit there, as I'll explain. But I first heard about this event in um, a blog called the Paranormal Network.wordpress.com, and it was public, an article published in 2012 said, um, Did a UFO crash in Hucknall? In November 1987. Now Hucknall is there. Hucknall's right on the southern end of that um, of that uh, this zone that was affected. And um, so it's, it's Hucknall. People in Hucknall did hear the noise, but it's a long, long way from the from the, from the centre of operations where where the event actually took place. However, um, I believe this is probably. Um, with slight, you know, slight errors of details, they're probably talking about the same event in this um, blog. I can only find one reference in the online archives of the local press, and this is from 2010. This is from the Nottingham Post. 
Um, the truth is out there near Mansfield. And this article is in, entitled, Do Aliens Exist? And if so, have they visited Mansfield? But it's an interesting article, actually, because it refers to the Ministry of Defence releasing its UFO files. These are the ones that Nick Pope has been dealing with, and she's been on telly talking about this a lot lately. <clears throat> and I don't think he was running the UFO desk in 1987, but what's interesting is that the UFO desk does re refer to this, the UFO report, the UFO files that have been declassified by the Ministry of Defence do refer to this event. So the witnesses were, the, obviously they told the police or they told somebody, and those, told, those people told the UFO desk at the Ministry of Defence. So this was recorded as a UFO event, which is very interesting. Right. Now this is the location, this is the first landing site. And this is this, this forest right in the centre of that area we're talking about. And this is called Thebes Wood. And um, it's in an area, the Ashfield district is today, it's today called the Nottingham Conurbation. And it is a large, it's a densely populated area. There are 111,000 people live in the Ashfield district. This is very different to Roswell, where the craft came down in a very remote area of the desert in New Mexico. And indeed, the Bellowin Mountains incident in January 1974, where a UFO came down in the remote and inaccessible mountain peaks of East Wales, Northeast Wales. Um, this area is kind of a checkerboard of big, these large towns like Kirkby and Ashfield, Sutton, Hucknall, areas like that. And in between, there's farmland, forest, um, in sort of equal proportions. So it's not like a city, but it's, um, it's, it is a densely populated area. There's a lot of people around um, all the time. So in order to keep a, a UFO craft secret, there must have been some additional challenges on the part of those who want to keep a secret. But it seems like they succeeded. But anyway, um, what, I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to, of course, the, the next step was for me to find out more evidence of this. So I got in touch with a man I know in this area, and we, we, took, we took a little expedition. We took a little expedition to Thebes Wood. And um, where we went, we went to the northern end of the woods. We went um, to this area here. We, we explored this part of the wood here. We put, there's like a pathway that runs down there. There's a few houses. And we took a walk down there to see if we could find any evidence of anything strange going on. We actually knocked on the doors of a couple of people's houses. There was no one in. We saw a few more people, just walk, um, ramblers, people walking their dogs. And um, a lot of them knew. They actually remembered this incident. They told us about this incident. It's surprising how many people in this area do know about it or have remembered it and, and don't accept the official story. And I'll tell you, about, I'll explain a bit more about the official story in a minute. <coughs> this, is forest, this is all forestry commission land here. This is um, coniferous uh, paper crop mostly. It's for, it's for timber, it's for paper, and um, these trees are, are planted closely together. As you see, there are like blocks of them with little pathways in between, regular straight pathways. And uh, so we walked along this one here, we wanted to see what we could find. We eventually came across <coughs> this area here, which is, um, there's no trees there. It's like a complete strip of land which, in which no trees have grown. There were small trees there. There were um, saplings, there were grass, moss, things like that. And um, some felled logs. And I counted the rings on one of the felled logs. It was 64 years old. The tree had been felled at the age of 64. And if we conclude that um, it's reasonable to think that that tree had been felled, the tree, the lot we found was from, was from this forest, then it's a tree that was there when this incident took place. Um, we came across a tree stump, a, a large tree stump, a tree trunk, which was about 10 feet high, and it was a, of a dead tree. The bark had gone, there were holes in it from where woodpeckers and beetles and things had made holes in it. But what was interesting was it did appear to have been burnt. And um, we don't know whether that was the result of a lightning bolt or a forest fire, we're not sure. But there was the heat, the, the burning and the heat is a theme that I'll come back to, because one of the things that was reported was when this... Um, when this craft came down in Thieves Wood, this object, whatever it was, it started a massive fire, a raging conflagration. There was a, uh, a huge fire brigade response in the area. Uh, the hospitals called a major incident. All the emergency services were put on standby. And um, fire brigades, uh, fire engines, 
congregated on the wood from as far away as Bingham, which is in the Radcliffe district, east of Nottingham. So this is a major fire brigade incident to put out the forest fire that had been started by this object landing there. But anyway, I, um, at the, I made a little video of this. I made a film. I'm a filmmaker, I have a YouTube channel. It was a bit amateurish, it wasn't, it wasn't a very good film, I must say. Um, but I, you know, I just sort of rambled on through it. I got a bit overexcited, as I tend to do um, in these various events. So it was a little bit scrappy, this film. But I got the basic information in, and um, I, I think I covered what I needed to cover in the course of that um, investigation. And um, I, at the end of the video, I put out an appeal for information. I said, if anyone knows about this, could you please get in touch with me? Could you please contact me? And someone put a comment. Someone called Nigel put a comment underneath the video saying, Ben, you're looking in the wrong place. I know where the UFO crashed. So I said, please do tell me, and I got in touch with the guy. And this is the man I contacted. This, this, this is the man who was commenting under my YouTube. This is Nigel. His name's Nigel Crowley. He's one of the unsung heroes of ufology, actually. Him and his brother have been investigating this event since 1996. They first found out about it in UFO Reality magazine. That was um, published in 1996, nine years after the event itself. Um, someone called Ashley Rye contacted the newspaper to tell them what had happened nine years earlier, and then they did a piece on it, which is where the Nexus, Harry Mason, for his Nexus article, got his information. Um, John King was the editor of that. He's not here today, but um, he's uh, still active on the scene. He's written a book about uh, Princess Diana, uh, but he's not here today, which is a shame. But he's a guy I know, he's a guy I know. But anyway, um, Nigel, like I said, has done a lot of hard work on this, and he hasn't um, published, he hasn't published really anything that he's done until now. Uh, but um, I met up with him, I spoke to him, he exchanged a lot of emails, and um, I, got, I suddenly got the impression, and there's, a, there's an interesting lesson here, I think, that there's a big difference between official history and folk history. Um, because, Official history doesn't only mentions this as it was a helicopter crash and there was a, a roadblock, okay? But folk history says something very different. And as I said, I met, even before I spoke to Nigel, I met people who lived in the area who knew something strange had happened that day. And they just, it was nothing they said was ever written down, but it was in, it was in the sort of my collective memory of the people of that area. You got there today, you'll still meet people who, who will say this. Something weird happened that night, and it wasn't a helicopter, and it wasn't a thunderbolt. There's an episode of The X-Files, actually. Um, now I, don't, I can't remember what episode it is, but it opens with a very, um, a very poignant and upsetting scene where there's these little aliens in some kind of, I think they're in a railway truck, and um, they're the, there's some hatches on the ceiling, some skylights on the ceiling, on the roof of this railway truck. They open up, and there's some guys in NBC suits um, above it, and they throw in these incendiary bombs, and fire breaks out, and the aliens run around screaming and burning. It's very upsetting. I can't remember. Do you remember? Anyone know what episode that was? Because, um, but then there's, there's this little boy. There's this like narration of this wise old Indi red Indian chief, and he says, um, "We don't believe the pale face is history. Just, the pale face relies on history, but the red man trusts in memory, because history lies and memory doesn't lie." And then when Nigel spoke to me about this, I, I, I recall that and I remembered it and I think, I thought, yeah. I think the, what was in that X-Files scene is very like what we're dealing with today. So yeah, um, Nigel for one thing, he told me where he thinks the helicopters came from. The helicopters which turned up at 2.15 in the morning had been on standby at RAF Coningsby and at RAF Cranwell, which were Cold War bases. I think um, one of them has been shut down now, which are nearby, and they were they were waiting. They were on standby. Um, he remembers. He remembers um, the week after that event, the electricity was cut off, the water was cut off too. And another guy, this other guy I just spoke to, Dan Dan Bostock, another local researcher, he said that um, they had to. That it snowed one day, and they basically shoveled snow into the bath to melt down so they could wash. He remembers doing that with his family. He was a kid at the time, but he remembers it very well. Um, and it was reported in the local media, but it was reported as a helicopter crash. And um, now you know the year I'm, I did this sec this investigation was 2014. It was last year. There were three helicopter crashes that year. Do you remember? 
There was one that crashed on, a, on top of a pub in Glasgow. There was one in London, there was one in, and there was another one in Norfolk. Now, there was no need to seal off dozens of square miles of the countryside with, with a massive military force to deal with, these, with the crashed helicopter. You just put a bit of tape around it and leave a body, oh, a body on guard. That's all you have to do. So, um, like I said, I think a lot of people at the time did not buy the official story. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't believe it. And there was a, the large area was actually off limits for. Nigel says an entire week. This this whole area was off limits. Now that there, that road there is the A60. It's the main road between Nottingham and Mansfield. And that was that was closed. There were police roadblocks at both ends. This is the West Nottingham to College. <coughs> All that was closed, was closed off south of there. This, main, this other main road, that's Kirkby and Ashfield there. And um, that there you go down south, you get to Nottingham. That whole area was shut. And um, for a week. No one went in, no one went out. Not without the permission of the people, um, whoever it was that was running the operations within this area. And there was a, there were, there was a military um, guard it was a military cordon inside this, and the police were dealing with the roadblocks. And um, the traffic, the traffic between Mansfield and Nottingham was all diverted eastwards around Glyndeth. So down a small road, there'd have been a lot of traffic jams, so people would remember this. This, and this situation went on for a week. It really, a uh, big disturbance in the, in the local area. Now, Nigel showed me where he says the object came down. That's here. There we see that area there is a square piece. These, these, um, this forest is all divided into like these blocks, these square blocks, about 300 feet by 600 feet, and uh, two of them are gone. There, they've just vanished. And so um, I took, a, I made a second expedition to Thieves Wood with Nigel. We did a film about that as well, which is slightly better than the first one. Still not ideal, but again, get the basic information out. Um, this is, this is mature coniferous trees. They're 80 to 100 feet high. They're big trees in this forest. You go into this area here, into this little square bit, and there's nothing there but grass, there's bushes, there's a few saplings, there's some small trees, but nothing else grows there at all. Now, Nigel says that the trees close by have been damaged by radiation. He pointed, to, he pointed me to, um, he said the tops were drooping over and he said there were marks on the bark of the trees that had been around at the time, which indicates they were damaged by, by um, directed energy, basically. Now, obviously we need someone who knows what they're doing, who understands trees and understands their anatomy, to, to maybe do some additional research on this, because there does need to be additional research done to confirm or deny that. Um, but there was, like I said, there was a huge fire. Fire engines were everywhere. They put everywhere. They put the fire out, and then the army moved in, told the fire brigade to get lost. And they took over the whole, the whole thing really when the fire was out. Um, the physical impact of the object destroyed a large amount of the, the woodland, and but then so did the fire. Now we don't know exactly how this fire started. Whether it was radiated heat from the object, or there was some kind of. Um, inflammable material there, it's, we don't know. But um, the military removed, when the military were in there for that week, they removed a four to nine inch layer of topsoil from that area, the area you see there, the, the empty area. The topsoil was removed. And uh, the reason for that, we're not sure. It could have been because the, the soil was contaminated with some kind of toxin from the object, or it may have been, it may have been highly radioactive, we're not sure. Another reason could be, for the same reason, again, going back to the Roswell incident of July of 1947, it may have been necessary from the point of view of the keepers of the secret to locate and secure any loose debris that might have scattered from the object. In the Roswell incident, a lot of this debris was um, just lying around on the ground. So it's possible they, the, the soil was removed to make sure that all the loose debris was, uh, was picked up, so there's no trace remain of this object. That come down. And here is a picture from the ground that I took when I was in the area. You can see the difference, can't you, between those big mature trees in the background outside the clearing 
and these small saplings and bushes on the inside. It's basically, there's, uh, there's nothing there really. Now, according to Nigel, it was actually, um, nothing grew there at all until about 2000. It was just basically bare sand. Some of the growth returned in about 2000, where um, these, these, um, this, this undergrowth and, and scrub began um, returning. I didn't, what I did was I picked up some soil from the interior of the clearing. And I, we took a little walk back into the main forest. And I picked up some soil also from the main forest and compared the two just as a kind of a control, just to see if there's any difference in consistency between the two the soils, the soils from inside and outside the area affected. And there was. There is actually, the soil inside the clearing is very sandy. And um, Nigel said that the, the, the topsoil had been replaced by sand in 1987, um, compared with the rest of the woods where it's kind of like dark brown loam kind of soil. <clears throat> Again, um, we need someone who knows what they're doing and is expert in this particular field to help us investigate, ideally. That's what we'd like to do. We'd like to get someone who knows what they're doing to, to carry out a study here. Um, the same goes for radiation. There may still be some residual radiation. If the object that came down was radioactive, it might have left some kind of trace behind. And uh, that could be picked up with there's equipment that can detect that, which would be helpful as well, if it's possible, if there's still radiation left over. There's also like a small depression or furrow. You can't see it in this picture, but it's in the middle of the clearing. It's, it runs lengthwise along the clearing, and um, there's like a wooden fence around it, and it's marshy at the bottom, so you can't really see much of it. But um, on the other side of the, 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 the as you saw in the, in the picture, the aerial shot, um, the clearings on the edge of the wood and beyond that there's a quarry, there's people working in a quarry. Now, <clears throat> this mysterious hardware, the shipwreck from the sky, as I said, it took off. It took off from Thebes Wood here, from that spot there. It came in nasty in this direction, it crashed there, bounced up into the air, and it um, continued for another four miles at low speed and a low altitude probably. And it eventually came down here at Annesley Hall. That's where, that's where it eventually crashed and came to rest in, um, in this particular area. This is a larger um, blow up of that area. This is Annesley Hall, which is, uh, Annesley Hall is actually a 13th century stately home. You can't see it very well on this map, but it's, um, it's very old. Like I said, it was built in several phases. There's a very old part, which is just bare walls and ruins. There's a couple of new parts that were built during the 17th century. Um, and there's some servants and guest quarters that were built during the 19th century. Um, even the newer parts of the building are derelict. Basically, the whole thing is, is, is derelict. The, the walls of the building itself of, of the main Ansley Hall are intact, but the windows are all smashed. Nobody is, really should be living there, but apparently there are people there, which is very strange. And we're not really sure, but it's, it lies in this area here, which is the, um, the Misk Hills, which is a local beauty spot. It's some high ground between Hutnell and Kirkby. It's, it's called the Misk Hills. There's uh, some abandoned coal mines. There's a few villages. There's some, um, there's some farms but nothing much else. And a lot of it is part is actually owned by the Annesley Estate and it's private property. And this is a strange thing. There's a lot of private land in that area, but you can access it easily. No one objects to people rambling on it or whatever. But Annesley Hall is sealed off quite rigorously. They don't welcome visitors and, they, and there's quite tight security there. There's a team of, ga of gamekeepers there allegedly gamekeepers. But I don't think they're just after poachers, I think they're after anybody who tries to enter the Ansley Hall estate. So we don't really know much about the, the owners. I mean, the original family, the Chayworth Musters, they owned Ansley Hall for 350 years, but they lost it in the sort of 19th century time. Um, and it's, as I said, it's fallen into disrepair. So, um, the question is, if, who, who owns it now and why are they so keen to keep people off it? That's a good question. Um, there's, a nuclear, there's a nuclear bunker nearby as well. It's on the other side of that road. It's just over here. There's a nuclear bunker. It's a multi-level Cold War continuity of government station, underground, 
in the event of a nuclear war with the Soviet Union, this was going to be like a headquarters for the military and the government. And um, that it's now closed. It's, it's sealed off, but you can see inside it, you can go down some stairways, there's a big grill covering the entrance, but apparently it's quite big, it goes down quite a few levels, and um, it was active at the time this event happened, and Nigel and I were wondering whether the personnel in that bunker played a role in the cleanup operation for this UFO crash. Now, we, um, we couldn't get into Amity Hall Estate, obviously, and we took a walk up this pathway, it's a footpath called the Dog and Bear Lane, and it's on the edge of the Alasia Estate. It's as close as you can get to the actual landing site of the UFO, or crash site of the UFO. Um, the UFO, as I said, it's, it's uh, taken off from Thebes Wood, and it landed in this area, which is known as the Warren, here. This is, this is the Warren, it's like a, an arable field now, from a farm, but it's sealed off. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a barbed wire fence between it and the road, and between us. Um, now the name Warren apparently is, um, Nigel told me, Nigel was born and brought up in that area and apparently on the maps, before 1987, the name of the Warren appeared on maps of the local area. After 1987 it was removed and the name Warren didn't appear anymore. It's very strange indeed. Now, um, this is, like I said, this is the biggest day. It stretches all the way to Hutnell in the south in bits and pieces. There's no buildings on it at all. The only buildings on it are derelict, but someone is there. Someone is actually, not, if not living there, at least occupying some of the Ansley Hall buildings some of the time. And I think most of them are the security guards. This is Ansley Hall. You can just see it there. Now, um, the windows are all smashed there, and out of frame, unfortunately, but towards the the, the right-hand side of that building is the servant and guest quarters, where there were definitely there were definitely people there. And Nigel says the lights are on at night, so somebody's in there, even though the windows are smashed. Somebody's using that building for something, although it's really not habitable. Very very strange. I'll show you the actual place the UFO came down. Now you see here Nigel pointing towards the Warren. This area of woodland and field is the Warren. And that's Nigel's hand there pointing, just showing where it is. And that's basically that place there is where the UFO came down in 1987. It landed there and it came to rest. And the helicopters and the troops moved in, sealed off the area, and uh, basically salvaged it. This is the allegation. This is what needs to be investigated. Now this is now this is interesting. This is a, this is an example of what is going on in that area right now. The fact that that the land is still in use and the land is still sealed off. We were just walking up the Dog and Bear Lane, just looking at, into Annesley Hall. I had my camera with me and I was filming. There are people watching us. This guy here in a car. Somebody's. This is one of the people who are running the security of the area. The camo dudes of the Nottinghamshire Roswell, in other words. And you see this guy was sort of like, he had his window down, he was watching us. He wasn't threatening, he was a long way away. Just out, he was parked outside Annesley Hall, but um, he was keeping an eye on us. He drove up and I stopped, just as we arrived. And um, it made us feel a little bit on edge. The area is patrolled around the clock, and um, it's very strange. Nigel actually tried to make inquiries with the, um, the land management, the, the company that runs it, the, um, the agency that runs it. And they wouldn't answer his questions, they put the phone down on them. He just asked a few questions like, who owns that land now? Can I speak to them? Is that the girl I met in the pub earlier? <laughs> Tell her I'll call her back. No, he, um, this, um, uh, yeah, basically, they wouldn't answer any of his questions. They were very, very, um, object they objected very much indeed. And I can't help wondering, is there a connection between their, or their unusual behavior? The fact that they, they keep that land so well, tightly controlled, the security is so tight, they're so uh, reluctant to answer questions, they're so unwelcoming to visitors, they're so, they get so paranoid when people just walk up a, a public footpath nearby and film. Is there a connection between that and what happened in 1987? Have they been told, have someone paid somebody, the landowner or whatever, you know, just keep people off this area? I wonder, I can't wonder that, I can't help wondering. 
So, um, the, the, to Google Earth image, I'll go back to that. Now, one thing that's immediately apparent about this, um, this is from Google Earth. You can see, check it out yourself at the moment. Um, this is the Warren, like I said, and this is where Nigel was pointing to where the object came to rest. Now, this isn't visible from ground level, but you can see here discoloration. There's a black mark there, black sort of chevron shaped mark. There's a couple of kind of like lines, like furrows, in the ground. This is probably not visible from ground level. Now I've looked at the other fields in the area, none of them have these features. I've looked way beyond the frame of this particular piece of Google Earth. I can't find another field in the area that has these features. So do these features come from the fact that that ground was in contact with the extraterrestrial artifact? Did the presence of this artifact, whatever it might be, have some kind of long-lasting effect on the ground and the, and the environment around it? We know that it, it caused the fire at Thebes Wood. It resulted in this large fire. When it landed here, did it have an effect on the ground around it? If so, then that's not without precedent. Um, uh, Philip, when he was speaking before, Philip Kinsella was talking about Peter Robbins. He's a friend of Peter Robbins. Um, I know Peter Rob Robbins as well. He's a very, very good researcher. He's written a book, Left at Eastgate with Larry Warren, about the Reynolds and Forest incident. And um, Larry Warren is one of the principal witnesses to the 1980 event where, in Reynolds, Reynolds and Forest, a UFO came down on, se on several occasions to the Earth. Now, one thing that uh, Philip mentioned was he, he visited the field, Cable Green where the craft came down on one of the nights, and where Larry Warren and several other people saw it. What's interesting is that the spot on the ground where that craft landed has been affected by the presence of that craft. The, the soil underneath, its actual, its actual consistency has changed. And it's changed, it must have changed because of some kind of contact with this craft. And Peter has actually gone and he's taken soil samples. He's had those soil samples analysed and they come back with some amazing results, like the chemicals are different, there's, there's less, uh, there's less uh, bacteria, things like that in the soil where there's an object landed. So are we looking at the same thing here? That's the question. I have a word with Peter about that, actually. So, um, now the area around, there was a cordon around Alzey Hall as well. Now this was the, uh, the military cordon around Alzey Hall. Again, you see, you see, um, it's very, very large. It's about many square miles here were completely sealed off. That there is the road that leads between, that's junction 27 of the M1. And this road just leads, leads up here into Ashfield. Uh, this, is the, this is the Mist Hills. All the Mist Hills were sealed off. And um, as Nigel explained, it went even down here, this little village of Linby here was um, affected. And right up here, here's the, these are the northern outskirts of Hutnell. And um, the western border of the cordon was basically marked by the M1 motorway. The M1 motorway was not shut. It continued operating during this entire operation. Um, now, I, I've, um, I took a little Google Earth drive along the M1, and I, from the M1 you can't actually see Annesley Hall because of, um, I don't know whether that's because of the features of the landscape, or whether because there's lots of trees planted at the side of the motorway. Now, it may have been different in 1987, because um, since then, there's, there's, there's a lot more, there's a lot more um, forest in the country now than there was back then. There's been rules about you know, people have to plant more trees than they used to on the sides of motorways and things like that. There has to be more trees planted. So um, I don't know if Annesley Hall in that area, the Warren, was visible from the M1 back in 1987, but I imagine it wasn't. Otherwise, the M1 would have been closed too, because they want to keep, they basically want to keep people away from that area keep people from seeing what's there. Um, I think the only way you can take a drive along there yourself, if you want, I can check it out. Um, now, um, the Mansfield incident is what it was called in um, Nexus. I call it the Nottinghamshire Roswell, and it has a lot in common with Roswell. Um, the, the 1947 Roswell incident from which it gets its name. Um, we have the, the, the crash of an unknown object, an, extra, an, an artifact from a non-human, otherworldly civilization of some kind came to grief on the Earth's surface. And we have the immediate involvement of the government, 
and the attempt to keep the occurrence secret. And they almost succeeded. Like I said earlier, they, they, they succeeded for a while, but the fact that I'm here telling you about this, and Nigel's been looking into it, is the fact they did, haven't quite succeeded. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you about this right now. Um, in summary, one or more objects flew in from the northeast over Mansfield. One of them came down in Thieves Wood, bounced, took off, landed again at the Warren, did considerable damage. There was fire that broke out at Thieves Wood. Um, and um, then it landed at the Warren, and we've got that strange soil effect. We have reports of people in the area, and now we have the strange behaviour of the, of the current managers of the land, where that happened. Um, now, after the end of this, now this, according to Nigel, this went on for a week. These cordons were in place for a week. After that, these, the, the area was reopened and things went back to normal. The public was permitted to go back into, the, into Thieves Wood. And um, there was nothing strange to be seen, apart, of course, from the, from the lack of topsoil and trees in that particular area of the wood. Um, the, the only conclusion is that if something, if there was an artifact there, from an extraterrestrial civilization, then that artifact was removed. All the forensic evidence must have been deliberately removed from the area. And they've been obviously been kept in some secure place somewhere, maybe to this day. Um, there are similarities to the Bearing Mountains incident, incident as well, because we have like the um, we have the presence of um, that there was a loud explosion, the shock wave that happened in January 1974 with the Bellerin Mountains incident. The lights in the sky as well. You got that with both the, the objects in the sky that people saw again. Now, um, as I said, you know, Roswell and Bellerin Mountains were in areas that were quite remote and inaccessible. This wasn't. This, this took place in an area with a high population density and a lot of transport infrastructure. And yet they succeeded in in the, in, in the secret salvaging of an extraterrestrial object. And the question you've got to ask yourself, I mean, this is, the, this is what the skeptics always say. Oh, it always happens somewhere remote, out of the way, where no one knows where it is. And, you know, why doesn't it ever happen in the middle of a city? Why don't these things ever crash in the middle of cities? It's always like on some root ranch in the desert, isn't it? Well, there's several reasons for that. Firstly, because um, the vast area, the vast, um, we, we don't appreciate in this country because we live on a densely populated island, but most of the world is actually much more sparsely populated. So sheer statistics alone makes it unlikely these objects, it, it's, they're going to not very often come down in populated areas. But secondly, they do come down in populated areas, they do come down in urban areas even. And there's a report from Donetsk in Russia of a UFO coming down in the middle of a city park. There's a report from Brazil, in Virginia, of um, aliens being seen in the middle of a city, in the middle of a large town, at least. You've got to ask yourself, you've got to beg the question, I mean, these, whoever it is who's keeping this secret, who organises this global policy of Roswell-style cover-ups, they do know what they're doing, and if they can keep things secret in an area like this, is there anywhere where they can't keep UFOs secret when they come down? That's the question. Now, um, there's been several theories put forward as to what uh, we're dealing with here, and the Nexus article doesn't really, the author of the Nexus article doesn't really deal with this as a, he doesn't really deal with it as a UFO event. And when me and Nigel and Dan were researching, we didn't draw conclusions. When we went and knocked on people's doors, and we spoke to people. We told them we were investigating a strange event that happened in 1987. We didn't mention the word UFO. We didn't mention space or space aliens or anything. We just said we're, we're investigating a strange occurrence. Um, this article may be, I think, hints of some kind of extraterrestrial involvement, but it doesn't say it out loud. And Harry Mason actually suggests it's some kind of weapons test. Now, I'm not so sure. Um, some people say it was an aerial nuclear explosion, where well, you got the loud bang and the shock wave, you get the heat effects in Thieves Wood. But with a nuclear explosion, you get much, you get a much more widespread effect of heat. You get fire. The fires would be breaking out everywhere, not just in Thieves Wood. And there's the, there's the um, specific military cordons. There's the, um, 
the lights in the sky, there's what the eyewitness saw and things like that. Um, so some people suggested it was a, um, yeah, that it was a weapon, but it was not one of ours, it was from the Soviet Union. Now that doesn't make sense, because this was 1987, the, um, the, the president of the USSR was Mikhail Gorbachev, who was actually um, instituting a revolution in that country. He was, it was called Perestroika, restructuring and the glasnost, openness. He, he wanted to completely change the Soviet Union into a, a country that was open to others and, you know, allowed in foreign trade and private investment and, and was friendly with the rest of the world. He wanted to end the Cold War, basically. And he succeeded. Um, in fact, the USSR itself was disbanded a few years earlier, became uh, Putin's Russia. But um, Gorbachev was a very close friend of Margaret Thatcher, who was the, um, the British Prime Minister at the time. Um, I think she was his only friend. <laughs> Her only friend, actually, I think. But um, why would he be firing weapons, secret or otherwise, at Britain? Doesn't make sense. It wasn't a, a bolide, a bolide meteor was another suggestion, or as Ali Roberts would call it, a bolide meteor. <laughs> Dearie me. A, a little aside actually, I mean, um, UFOs are as real as the aircraft that fly above our heads. Not my words, the words of the Right Honourable Paul Hellyer, MP, Minister of Defence for Canada. <coughs> Now, Paul Hellier, you, have you heard of Paul Hellier? Yeah. Well, yeah. He's the kind of guy that if he wasn't speaking out about UFOs, all right, the skeptics would say, I'll believe you when someone like that speaks out about UFOs. Paul Hellier, he, he doesn't have the average career path for a UFO nut. He doesn't wear a tinfoil hat, he doesn't stand on his hillside with binoculars. He's a civil engineer and politician and former Minister of Defence. So, so the skeptics, a, guy, a person like that is speaking out, the skeptics still don't believe us. I can say to people like, who, who maintain this stance, there's nothing to see. You know, cut the crap, stop raising the bar. Anyway, as Ronnie Corbyn would say, on with the joke. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, the, the way forward here is, um, I think more research needs to be done, obviously. Nigel and Dan and myself actually, we've done a, I think we've done an awful lot with the resources available. We've, Nigel in particular has, has carried out a very dedicated 26 year investigation into this event. Mm. And him and his brother have really done sterling work and they should be congratulated. It's just, I thought they, um, Nigel told me he might be able to come today but he hasn't been able to which is a great shame. But I do hope you all get to meet him sometime. Um, what needs to be done now, of course, is further investigation. Now, the Amersley Hall site is, is off limits, as I said. If you get in there, you'll be caught by security, you'll get arrested. But the, the, the Thieves Wood location is, is open. It's, it's public land, you can go and walk in there, and, and anyone can get in there and have a look at it. So um, we need, basically, someone who knows what they're doing, someone, someone who understands trees, soil, radiation and you know it would be great to have people like that who come forward and maybe do further investigation into that location to get more evidence and of course um i appeal for more witnesses to come forward obviously if there are any more witnesses um i also ask the government nick pope if you're listening could you please release more of the files on this event and it's affordable one hope but you've got to ask them haven't you but we're not to they have, the Ministry of Defence, as I said, has released its um, confidential files, files on this event that took place in 1987. It does match what was reported in Nexus and UFO Reality magazine. So this was, this was um, investigated by the Ministry of Defence, by the UFO desk at the time. So they, something did happen, okay, but obviously there may be more information kept secret still, which is not being released by the Ministry of Defence. The files relating to whatever it was that crashed and to what was retrieved. And that's the next step, we've got to get that secret out. And that ties in with the whole disclosure movement and things like that, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. But um, you may say, no hope of that, not a chance. And part of me agrees with you, but you never know. You never know. I'm very, very divided and sort of like torn between these two worldviews right now. So you never know. There may be some more updates. I'm going to. I'll keep you all posted because I'm going to do this. I'm going to continue um, investigating this incident and um, 
At any future lectures, I'll give you an update. But in the meantime, thank you very much. How many? How have I got time? And then Neil? Yeah, just uh, when it crashed, I know a lot of people talk about seismic surveys and things like that. Is that anyone kind of got any seismic results from that area? Maybe? And that's a, that's a good. That is a very, very good um, question, and that is one of the things that could be done. And now, um, you probably wouldn't need any experts, probably the lab is that is available at the British Geological Survey, so that is a, a good area of research. Because Bellwood Mountains, of course, did publish yeah. their data, yeah. and there was a shockwave, so it probably has a seismic effect. So, thanks, Neil. Thank you. And lady there. Um, it was very interesting, thank you. You're welcome. You said that, um, you said that when, when you were talking to people in the area, Although people have stories to tell, nothing's ever documented. Why do you know Well, I, I think it seems, to, it seems to be almost something that people know about and think about and talk about. But as far as the local media is concerned, they discuss a helicopter crash. Mm. Even outside um, of the local media, no one talks about it. Well, the ufological press covered it, and Nexus covered it as something more. But in terms of the local newspapers, nothing was mentioned, even though in 2010 the Nottingham Post revealed that the Ministry of Defence had investigated it. So it's kind of like, it's, it's a strange situation, I know. Um, we've not come up with, obviously there, there may be more studies to be done through media archives and things like that. And you spoke to local people, mm. and, and, you got, and you have you documented that, what they said? We, none of them wanted to appear on film, no. but we spoke, to, we spoke to three people in the area, um, and uh, one of them, mentioned it. And there's, there's another person who actually lives in um, a, a town east of Nottingham who also remembers it. And another person we know in Kirkby who, who remembers it. But I'm not mentioned, no, but Dan Bostock, he knows it. So it seems that there are a lot of people in the area who seem to know about it. And why didn't Nigel want to come? <laughs> why I don't you? think he, I just think he couldn't make it. I mean, Mark, 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 Mark's in touch with him. Okay, um, next time. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. Hello at the back. Yeah, it's good talk. Um, I was going to ask you, how often do you think shoot downs and crashes are happening over Britain? Do you think it's kind of common, like every five years, or what sort of gist do you get about how often this happens? Well, in terms of the research, on this book here has detailed about a hundred events over the course of an entire century. So that's an average of one a year. Um, but the UFO events, in terms of um, detections and things like that, are very, very common indeed. Um, the the national defence systems are constantly being alerted with various um, incidents. Some of them reach the public domain, others don't. It's, it's hard to know exactly how often this happens because we have to take into account things like um, the number of people, times people witness something, the number of times it's reported that jets have been scrambled, things like that. One of the big divisions in ufology is from the C SETI approach people say there's never been hostile interceptions and uh, I'm, I'm obviously Flying Saucer Review, that's me. And um, I dealt with a particular case, I think it was Carlisle, where a saucer was, had fired, been fired at by a tornado. The missile was sucked up, was with the, uh, this is 1995, the tornado was sucked vertically up and with the UFO when it left. And for me, these are combat incidents. And I know that I've seen what you write on the internet and things, and you sort of agree with the gist of it that we do open fire on these things. You know, I mean, there's a famous case of Milton Torres in 1954, yes. it was in 1957. He was actually ordered to open fire on a radar return. But um, he was, see, and it seems that um, as far as um, the, 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 whatever these things are, this intelligence that is behind these objects, they seem to have a wide variety of motives and agendas. Yeah. Some of them are indeed friendly and benevolent, but not all of them. I, I mean, um, C. Seti, people like that, they, they seem to think they're all like that. They're, they're all very, very nice. They're not all like that. Luckily, the majority seem to be. Aren't they? What struck me it was um, back in about 2000, I think, this chat, it was so kind of resonant and quite worrying. And like I said, I'm pro, you know, I'm not anti establishment. So basically, the guy who saw the tornado suck vertically rang uh, the local air, air um, service. And they sent people around who threatened him. And they said to him, this is 1995, and it's peculiar, they said, we can make you die in a car crash if you talk about this to anybody. So he talked to me about this, and this is one of the difficulties in British ufology. Um, there's people with these experiences where they tell the authorities, I've just seen one of your aircraft taken, 
And then they, rather than saying, well, thank you for your concern and helping us, they're threatened. Now, I don't think if that's, you know, I'm, I'm talking retrospectively 20 years ago, but it's, it's so, we should know how serious this is, that even our own members of the public, and it, particularly when you're investigating, people are frightened. They're yes. frightened from our own authorities as much as frightened of what the entities themselves were. Absolutely. I mean, the um, very serious subject. Yeah, I mean, the, the people. A lot of witnesses have been harassed, sometimes by uh, government agents, yes. and, and some, sometimes by strange people who don't appear to be quite human. It, it depends. It's it's, it's uh, the men in black issue is, is a big subject. But there's no doubt that the government does suppress information on this. Sometimes they'll just ask you nicely not to tell people, but they do threaten people. They will threaten people. And as for dying in car crashes in 1995, well, a couple of years later, they yes. made Princess Diana yeah. die in a car crash, didn't they? That. That's a big subject. It's a shame that John King's not here because he, he knows all about that. Oh, it's, oh Neil. Um, We've got time, actually. Is that sorry. okay? Well, I'm sure Ben will hang around, yes. and, and he, you know, you want to have a chat with Ben, that'll be fine. Okay, so 20 minute break, and then we'll back finally for Gary's school. Okay. speech on the Nottinghamshire Roswell and it went very well indeed and I think I gave a lot of good information to people. People um, have been very approving in their feedback of the event that I, um, that I just did. The other two speakers, Philip Kinsella and Gary Hazeltine, were very good indeed. Very interesting. Philip Kinsella talking about his own ET contact experiences. Gary Hazeltine talking about ETs, the politics and the media. I do very much recommend these events. I recommend UFO Truth magazine as well. And um, please do get active in the world of UFOs, ladies and gentlemen. Don't just think about it. Do something. Talk, tell your friends. Subscribe to the UFO Truth magazine. And, and also tell as many people as you can about what you know about this subject, this vital subject. I think it's the most important subject in the entire world. And hopefully soon we can uh, live in a world in which it's not secret and it's not ridiculed and it's not dismissed. And um, tar cast aside, as it has been for all these years. So thanks very much for watching. Thanks to, to uh, Tiberius Cook for doing the camera and um, all the, uh, Katrina, Jonathan, who organised this conference for everyone who turned up.